live. Um, I am super excited to have Anthony Law on here and um, we are going to talk about a topic that I think is important for a lot of mums, a lot of practitioners and stuff like that, mainly because of the message that's been put out there about this certain condition, adaptation, so to speak, right? And that is diastasis recti. And there isn't a better person to chat to about this um, than Anthony Lowe. Right, so Anthony, nice to have you here. Thank you for being here. Thank you very much. And very generous and kind words of you. I'm sure there's lots of great people to talk to, much better than me. Ah, well, I, 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 I do love our discussions. I do love how you challenge what's been taught and told out there right now. A lot of my followers and people on my friend list, they may not know who you are. So why don't you introduce yourself and tell us who you are? Sure. My name is Anthony Lowe. Um, you can find out about me at anthonylowe.com. Um, and I'm a physiotherapist. I've been working in, oh, I started studying physiotherapy in the past um well nearly 30 years 28 30 years um so yeah 29 nearly 29 years and i work at the junction of musculoskeletal also known as ortho um pelvic health and sports uh in in those areas of physiotherapy and i have a particular passion for uh antenatal postnatal and uh, pelvic health uh, conditions in particular, um, seeing as though I've done that for pretty much my whole working life. So, yeah, it's good. Was that planned from the beginning or did you just kind of sort of went into it? No, not planned, not planned. I just, I found out I was okay at it. Um, I'm, you know, I wanted to get better at treating the pelvis. Um, and so... Involved, then public health is involved so um, that's how it evolved I, it started with antenatal classes and postnatal uh, antenatal clinic coverage postnatal uh, antenatal classes and then uh, treatment for uh, symptoms during pregnancy as well as afterwards it started off more with pain and then it just it naturally evolves into incontinence um, and pelvic organ prolapse as well right amazing Okay, so uh, we're gonna, as I said earlier, we're gonna talk about diastasis recti. Now let's start with the basics. What is diastasis? How would you define diastasis? Diastasis rectus abdominis is, um, is a gap, a, a noticeable gap, the width of which it varies depending on who you're speaking to. Um, and it's where the, the, the six pack muscles uh, separate a little bit so they get wider yeah. um, and uh, that's pretty much it uh, they, it's not a herniation so there's a piece of tissue that holds two edges together between yeah. the two muscles it's called the linear alba yeah. uh, and a hernia through the midline is called a hernia when you separate the tissue there so when it's not separated, it's still intact, then it's not considered a hernia. So, yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. that's it. Awesome. Who gets diastasis? Like, which type of population do you often see it in? Yeah, anyone can get di diastasis. I call it diastasis. You say diastasis. Um, anyone can get it. So um, children can be born with it. Um, one of my sons was born with it um uh, men can get it i have a i have one uh with an umbilical hernia huh. um yeah i know i don't talk lots about it but i have spoken about it um and women can get it as well everybody can get it when you get it well it depends so um you know you can get it from lifting lots of heavy weight so you you don't have to be pregnant or uh postpartum to get it but most commonly um, seen uh, during pregnancy and postpartum. That is by far the most common reason why people have it. Yeah. And, and, and we see it in a pregnancy as an adaptation, right? You, um, yeah. the, 
this, this stretching because your body has to hold a baby and it needs the size and that's what happens, right? You grew a human. So yeah, that's the population that we see it in. You stretch, you, your abdomen stretches, your baby uh, is born uh, and it doesn't matter if it's a belly birth or a vaginal birth. Um, and then the space that was occupied there the, th from the baby and your uterus shrinks over time and, and all the rest of it. And so you're left with some tissue that's just a little bit more lax than it used to be. Yeah. What are your thoughts around the messaging of a healing diastasis, right? <clears throat> yeah. <clears throat> Or healing diastasis in pregnancy and stuff like that that we see a lot going around <laughs> yeah so let's that's two questions so the first one healing a diastasis well that's afterwards maybe we do the first one preventing a diastasis in pregnancy i don't think that there's any good evidence that we can prevent it um you know i not any good ones that i can think of anyway um so if your abdomen is going to grow your unique tissue factors your family history your genetic history the activities that you do like all of those things may or may not contribute we don't have any good evidence to predict who will and who won't get diastasis um it seems like everybody has some sort of stretching the amount of which is unknown i am sure there is a small percentage of people who do not stretch at all um they've got very very stiff tissue and that's just how that is um so you can't really predict how to prevent it uh obviously not exceeding your tissue capacity so that you don't herniate or tear things is probably going to be helpful but i'm talking about you know if you're trying to lift up a massive car off a person who got trapped under a car like anybody can develop any sort of musculoskeletal injury that way i'm not sure i want to call diastasis an injury because i don't think it usually is which leads us to the second part healing a diastasis implies that an injury has taken place uh that's kind of like saying um you want to heal your body because you grew a human like did you injure your body like you can get a birth injury i'm not saying that you can't get birth injuries is diastasis a birth injury, a, a pregnancy injury? I, I don't think so. Uh, you know, it's different if it's a hernia and you felt it go pop. Uh, but, you know, people talk about feeling that with a diastasis, but maybe it was already there and you felt something else go pop and then you noticed things. It's really hard to say. Um, yeah, I'm not a fan of healing a diastasis. I'm a fan of... Your body adapted to grow a human. And if you want it to adapt in a way, in a particular way that suits your goals, then that's what we're doing too. Yeah, agreed. Now, there's this thought, at least part of my teaching was, if you breathe a certain way in pregnancy, right? The belly breath, the 360 and you breathe that way in pregnancy, you have a higher chance of reducing your chances of diastasis postpartum, right? Okay. What are your thoughts about that? Because I'm well, thinking, that doesn't make sense. If I'm, if I'm 36 pregnant, heavily pregnant, I'm not going to have the belly breath and have my diaphragm go all the way down and then have the 360. Like, there isn't space for that. <laughs> I'm growing a baby, right? Well, the other thing, the reason why I laugh is because it doesn't make sense. Like if we're a 360 degree breath to me yeah, is the diameter of your ribs gets wider. Yeah. Right. Your rectus abdominis attaches to your ribs. So if you're going to spread them wider, you're, making then big you're, you're increasing the diameter of your abdomen. Like you're more likely to pull it apart. Yeah if you're doing that, like it's not going to reduce it. Like it's not reducing your risk or improving your chances of yeah. afterwards. So I think the theory behind that, if you can have that a big inhale, right? A more of that stretching, then you can have a stronger exhale and contract it back that way. But then again, it's very okay. far-fetched, right? 
Well, it just doesn't seem to make sense. Like, I have no doubt that breathing like that is helpful, especially if you don't currently have that as something easily done by you. I have no problems with doing the things, but yeah. the explanations need to make at least some sense. Um, okay, let's see if we can make it make sense. So breathing like that, increasing the diameter of the ribs, um, you know, maybe it puts an outward stretching pressure on your linear alba in addition to what your baby is doing to you. And so maybe, I don't know, maybe you're tensioning it more by stretching it more, in which case, like, all you have to do is just climb some stairs really fast and your breathing will just start to increase and you'll put more pressure on there. Um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I, 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 if somebody can explain to me the mechanism for why that might work, that would be wonderful. There's no research that I can remember that talks about that being a thing. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> now, as, as far as the, the separation, for the longest time, we've been worried, well, you know, people have been worried, practitioners and uh, clinicians and um, so to speak, they, they have been worried about the interact eye distance, right? Mm. The width of the linear alba. And then with more research and stuff like that, then we're like, right, interact eye distance doesn't really matter. Now we care more about the depth, tension. the tension. And ah, oh, the depth, yes. Yeah, the depth. <laughs> yeah. What are your thoughts around that? Is, is the depth something that we want to try and reduce? Is it important to reduce? Does that impact someone's ability to function? I know there's a lot of questions on that. Yes, but... there is. <laughs> I, think, I think the first thing that we should do is try to understand what we're trying to change here. Yeah. So um, if we say that the linear alba when you're born is like this piece of paper here. Right. Um, I can make it taut by pulling it apart, right? So I'm pulling it apart and I'm making it taut. Fantastic. Now, if I bring the edges together, yeah, it's going to get bent. Yeah. We often call that doming. Yeah. But the length of the tissue is still the same. Yeah. And so we say, oh, we want to do transverse abdominis. Cool. And then we don't want it to go this way either because going this way is apparently bad. That's invagination or the depth of the diastasis. But it's like, well, the tissue is the same length. I'm still confused as to how we're changing the length of the tissue if we've got our rectus closer together. Now, is it possible to bring the edges of the rectus together and then tension the linear alba via the transversus in that position there. Maybe, maybe. Um, how much can we get your transversus to pull? Uh, if you have a four centimeter separation and you bring that to, to be one centimeter or two, two centimeters width, then maybe if you can get your transversus to pull, Maybe you could do that, but then, you know, the, the, the anterior rectus sheath, which is formed by the sheaths of the internal and external oblique as well, they're at the front there. So, like, I mean, trying to tension the linear alba would mean that you would have to pull other muscle sheaths down as well. Like, it doesn't, I don't think it works that easily, uh, is the bottom line. <laughs> I don't like it's it's a set length unless unless you can make the whole rectus muscle slide and you know um jp even vigoden he showed that um in in those older people that the rectus abdominis slid on that posterior rectus sheath yeah. but it was still firmly attached at the front so like unless you can get the whole of the rectus muscle to move and slide inside the sausage casing, I, I, I struggle to see how we can tension the linear alba via 
transversus only. Whoa. Yeah. We do see the linear alba drop. I'm just trying to think. That we do see the linear alba drop down, as in move away from the skin when doing certain activities. So, so that can be done. Yeah. Um, but it tends to be on a curl up on an auto curl up more than it is from yeah. and in which the transversus works by the way when you do an automatic curl up the transversus works yeah. so um you know i i'm trying to make it work and i can't if it's a fixed length across already then the only way that it changes in my mind is um through adaptation only and that's the body and maybe it's genetically programmed how much you come together is genetic mm. because you know it, it's got a lot of stretch force on it anyway so yeah i think we just make people as strong as, we can. as possible for the tasks that they want to do you know we, we we focus a lot on the width and the depth and the tension that's but, my next question yeah well, I don't know what your question is. is we focus a lot on that, but oh, how much? Why? Yeah. Is linear elbow tension important, Anthony? To me, it's important to know if you're going to exceed tissue capacity. Um, it's difficult to tell if the pressure is going to exceed your tissue capacity and you're going to develop a hernia. Yeah. If it's easily deformed, if you've got your linear alba and you can easily push it in, yeah, then I don't think we're super tense. And that's that balloon analogy that I talked about yeah. a couple of years ago. You know, you can blow up a balloon very, um, you know, not very much air inside the balloon. And when you push on the balloon, the balloon just, you know, deforms to your finger. But if you blow up the balloon to the point where it almost might burst, and if you've ever felt that before, the skin of the balloon is super, super tight. And when you push on it, it doesn't give way very easily. Like, I mean, that's something that I would consider hard doming and no research to say that it's not good for you. It just seems to me that in the absence of good research, it might be an indication at that point to consider, well, there's other things that I could be doing rather than running this close to the line. Okay. Uh, yeah. Okay. Now, what happens if uh, someone can't produce tension no matter what they do, right? What are- Can't produce tension? Can't, I haven't met these people. They can't produce t t tension in the linear alba regardless of the exercise they do. What would the, the risks of that be? All you have to do to produce tension in the linear alba is let your tummy hang out and bear down a little bit and make yourself look more pregnant than when you were pregnant and that linear alba tension will be there. You just created tension. So I haven't met somebody who can't create tension in the linear alba. If you mean an active contraction in a relaxed position without gravity and viscera pushing on it. Yeah. Yeah. That's a different question. <laughs> question then. That question. So if, if somebody can't generate an active tension of the linear alba when what supine lying on their back supine yeah. what, and what was the rest of the question what happens to is there any danger to that as far as the uh you know getting hernias and stuff like that well because they can't produce tension on it yeah uh i think that i think the chance of hernia is lower than if you can put tension through it I think that's the first thing. Uh, the second thing, like I said, you can always put tension through it. All you have to do is go prone on all fours and you'll put tension on that linear alba. Um, what, what's the implication? I don't think there is any particular implication that can't be overcome by learning a different strategy, a different coordination pattern. Um, you know, this whole idea of having to qualify before progressing. Oh, but until you get tension in the linear alba through a transversus contraction, you can't progress in your exercise. That's ridiculous because the amount of pressure that you get just from standing and walking 
which we're not suggesting people lie down until they can do an isolated transversus contraction with tension in the linear alba. So, you know, this sort of stuff is going on in their everyday life. That's why I'm confused by stopping people from doing things because they haven't qualified yet, you know. Isn't the fear around producing that kind of outward pressure, the idea is that it's going to make the separation bigger or worse? It might, but then it might also trigger enough adaptation that you thicken the tissue and it gets stronger as well. Like how much is too much and how little is too little. Um, certainly we do a lot of things out of fear. And again, what is the person's goal here? Yeah. Um, you know, if, if the goal is to try and get your belly as flat as possible, then get a personal chef, get a personal trainer, um, get somebody to carry the baby for you, put your baby on bottle feeding so that the hormones don't change any potential elasticity of the skin and tissues um, or, or have a wet nurse if you want the breastfeeding thing. Do you know what I mean? Like how far do you want to go to achieve the goal that people are looking to do? Um, yeah. yeah, no. In general, no, I'm not concerned if they can or can't. In fact, I don't even bother testing it except for teaching. I do it for teaching to show people, right? But I don't, I don't particularly care. Yeah. Uh, in others, unless they tell me that they care, right? <laughs> then yeah. If it's important for me to qualify myself, you know, they go, well, I need to know that you can do this. It's like, all right, I can do this. Let's do this. It's your time, not my time. So, <laughs> yeah. So, say you, you you have a patient, they come to you and they say, Anthony, I think I have diastasis. Can you check me to see if I have it or not? Or, yes, we'll do that. How we'll does do that. that conversation go so that it allows them to, to sort of have the answers that they want, but also not have the fear around diastasis? Yeah, look, uh, I think the first thing is listening to them and understanding what having a diastasis means to them, right? So understanding what that means. If, if you do have a diastasis, what does that mean to you? What's the implication for you going forwards here and trying to understand what that is? Because just because I don't think having a diastasis is particularly worrisome from a function point of view it doesn't matter that that's going to be that person's experience or their concerns even maybe it's an aesthetic concern okay well that's okay right um so if they say oh having a diastasis means that my core is weak and i'm going to have bad back pain for the rest of my life well i have an issue with that uh, if they say I don't know. I got I got told to come here because somebody said I had a diastasis. Go and see this guy. Okay, cool. And we go from there. And if somebody says, um, "Oh, you know, I just want a name for it because my insurance company won't do anything without a diagnosis," well, okay, cool. We can do that too. Um, what it means to them and why it's important is important. If somebody says, "Oh, I, I want to know if I have a diastasis because," Um, you know, I'm a model and they kind of get upset if you don't have a very flat tummy and all the rest of it, like before I was pregnant. Yeah. Um, and I want to keep modeling. It's like, okay. It, like to me, the concern is not invalid, no matter what it is. It might be different to what I think is important. Um, however, it's not about me and what I want. It's about them and what they want. So you asked me, how would that go? Well, understanding first. And then the second thing would be um, an assessment. And during the assessment to see what is and isn't possible and to uncover more and more beliefs, attitudes, meaning and stories that they have, um, their underlying biases and assumptions about having a diastasis and then trying to use experience before giving knowledge to uh, give them 
a different perspective perhaps so that they can make a more informed choice about which way they want to go with not only what they want to do about it and the management of it but also reconsidering or not what they believe about it their attitude towards it what having a diastasis means to them um you know what what stories that they have around it um yeah i think that that's important yeah at what point would you um recommend surgery is that would you sort of you know after a certain say inter recti distance and you feel right we've been worked long you know we've we've worked on it long enough chances of it reducing are lower and if the client isn't happy aesthetically with how their abdominal wall looks and stuff like that would that then be the point okay surgery may be the way to go now maybe um you know why why having a surgery is important um i don't think there's very good evidence this is why this is why an abdominoplasty was taken off um public health operations i think because i don't think there's good evidence to say that diastasis causes back pain and other problems um and so that's important to acknowledge that's number one so for aesthetic concerns yeah. sure like i mean you know uh there's nothing wrong with having an abdominoplasty for aesthetic concerns but it's it's like um going on a holiday if you're sad because your your work situation is sad then when you go on a holiday you're still going to be sad, right? But you're not at work. But then you have to come back and be sad again. Like if you don't, if, you, if you're having an abdominoplasty because uh, you've been told that that's the reason why you have a back pain and then you have the abdominoplasty and you still have back pain, like that's a very expensive way to find out if something was true or not. Um, you know, if you have an abdominoplasty because you don't like how it looks, okay. Um, but just know that also an, an abdominoplasty can't take care of all the stretching that was involved in necessarily, right? Like it, it becomes a, a cost benefit ratio, a risk reward ratio as well. Um, and so, you know, all of those things go in there. Basically, I'm avoiding answering the question specifically because the point at which a person wants to go for the surgery is up to them. Yeah. There, there are some suggestions that I would make, and that is let's give it a decent amount of time. Don't be making this decision six months postnatally, right? Don't go off and do that. I usually recommend at least two years, if not more, because you need your youngest to be able to take care of themselves somewhat. Mm. You, you, you're going to need people around you to help you for four to six weeks because you won't be picking people up. You won't be picking these kids up and carrying them and running after them necessarily. Now, some people can, okay, fine. But a lot of people can't and it's going to be hard. You're going to need that support. Um, it's major abdominal surgery. Um, so, you know, those are the things that I, I would say is important. I, I, I certainly don't think um, for the reason of, you know, you, 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 you can't join the two halves of your anterior abdominal wall or, you know, you can't generate tension across the midline. I don't think these are good enough reasons from a physio, biologic, biomechanical point of view for me um i don't think that passes for me it's for me um and that's not to judge anybody who has gone and done it for those reasons by the way because this is what i was taught too i just i i can't make sense of it that way however i can make sense of it and why don't we just simplify it you don't like it you've been trying hard do it or you don't like it, you don't want to try hard. And so have it, 
that's okay too. That is your body and your choice. Like if that's where we're going, then that's what autonomy looks like. Now I can't be bothered doing all the rehab. I'm just going to have the operation. Okay. Yeah. Okay. You know, like no judgment. Okay. I'm here for you. Mm. You know. It's down. It's it's a personal choice, like you said. It's it's down to the individual and and what they want out of it, right? And the, the meaning of having. Yeah. Choices. Yeah, and and you know, understanding why you're getting it. Um, what are your hopes? What are your dreams? What's the worst case scenario look like? Um, you know, all of those things. What What if you're still left with a smaller bulge, but not dead flat like before? Is that going to be considered a, a negative outcome for you? Um, you know, talking about all of these things is important with your surgeon. Yeah. Like what, what is your idea of success versus the surgeon's idea of success versus what's technically possible, you know? I had another qu question about the inter recti distance. Is there any risk of having a big gap as far as um, a protrusion of the intestines through it and stuff like that as you age, maybe as you get older? Say you have 10 centimeters, let's say, is there any health risk to that of such a big gap? I, I'm unclear on the specifics of the question. So if we have a diastasis that's large, say 10 centimeters wide, um, you know, it, it depends on how much visceral fat is behind that. It depends on how much activity the person is doing. Um, it depends on other conditions that they may or may not have um you know that they might be completely functional and healthy and above average in everything yeah. except for having a large diastasis um you know there are those that will tell you that uh you know the 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 digestion's not as good because you don't have the closure at the front mm. maybe but I don't remember reading research about that. Um, you know, there, there's the idea that um, you could herniate or, or trap a piece of bowel. Well, I think the smaller to medium sized ones are more dangerous for that, not the very large ones. Like the very large ones, it's very hard to pinch something in there because 10 centimeters is huge, right? In terms of like, it's hard to trap a piece of bowel that's small in something that's much much larger than it so um yeah i'm just trying to i'm just trying to think from that point of view but otherwise no we don't have much in the way of of that there is um tracy spitznagel's study which was an average age of 50 um which seemed to show a correlation for those presenting to a urogynecology practice of having associated pelvic floor dysfunction like two-thirds of the women or something like that had a diastasis and yeah but like so many women have a diastasis after three months anyway after a year so you know that's a correlation that's not a causation we don't see all the women who didn't show up to the practice who have the same diastasis size and no problems at all um because they're not turning up because of <laughs> other problems. So um, yeah, it's, it's really hard to say. And of course it sounds, it sounds like I avoid things because it's like, we need more research. It's unclear. The problem is, is that we need more research and it's unclear. So, um, you know, let, let's, whichever side you sit on, yeah. try to find evidence, even anecdotal evidence that breaks what you want it to be because i think that's the most scientific we can be i agree and i think because we don't have a lot of research and there aren't straight answers right we just somehow try to be more cautious and stuff like that and in the long run we may not be helping these women because we're not no. them enough right we're not yeah well underloading is a big problem 
you know, I think older adults get to the, um, I guess, the frail stage because their world gets smaller and smaller with every negative experience they have. You know, you only need somebody to fall over and break something when walking on grass for them to go, you know what, I'm not walking on grass anymore because I don't want to fall again and break my wrist. Yeah. Um, you know, and so their world just became a lot smaller because they're not willing to walk on an uneven terrain instead of, hey, why don't we make it so that you're stronger, fitter, faster, and better able to manage, un, uh, you know, uncertainty because we do have evidence that seems to indicate that doing those things can be helpful. The application of speed and power, um, you know, those sorts of things are important for balance and falls prevention. Yeah. So yeah, diastasis or not, you can train that. Uh, if you have a diastasis and you struggle to do rotation, I would suggest to you that you should train rotation. Yeah. There's no reason why you can't. Before I came on, I went on Google just to see the kind of messaging out there. And I'm talking about these websites are publishing a, a post in 2021 20, talking about how you need to avoid sit-ups and planks and rotation exercise because it makes diastasis worse. And it, it makes it really hard for people like us who are actually trying to make people stronger because they come to us already with the thoughts of, I can't do that and that and that, right? And we have to have this conversation where we need to break those beliefs and sort of just help them understand. And yeah, it just makes- It's really disappointing. Um, however, that is what, we physios were taught and quite often if we're taught something and it seems like the majority believe it then you're safe to say it and repeat it um, and that's why I would love people who have any doubts about advice like that to speak up and even if you share it as an uncertainty you know I'm not really sure if the advice of avoiding sit-ups and crunches and twisting actually does make diastasis worse. I'm really not sure about that. Like even just that is better than repeating the thing which is said so certainly, and we don't have any certain evidence to back that kind of statement up. Uh, so yeah, it's um, the more voices, the more, the more people hear that there is uncertainty and that there is a different way then the more normal it will be to hear your provider, your trainer, your coach, to be able to say, I understand the condition that you have. And I understand the historical advice that was given, but we're on the sexy cutting edge right now. And there are amazing things that have been done in the past that can be done now and that will go on in the future because um, yeah, just, just because we have the ability to share that now through the internet. So the scary advice can be shared. Let's also share empowering advice, you know, advice that reminds people that they're strong, capable, adaptable, and resilient. So, you know, uh, that's what I would ask people to do, to speak up that way. Love that, Anthony, I, I love that. Now, there's this thing that I heard before, I don't know, whether it's true or not, but they, I think it's part of some of the stuff I was taught. It's about the a tone of your uh, abdominal wall, right? The, the more shredded you are to, to speak, the higher the, the tone of your abdominal wall, uh, the stronger your wall is essentially, right? The higher the chances of you getting a bigger diastasis in a pregnancy. It's almost like there's a fight between the growing uterus and your abdominal wall, and then all these things happen, right? <laughs> so yeah, have... look, I, I think there was a piece of research that seemed to indicate that more active people seem to have a higher prevalence, but like in my memory, it's just relatively low numbers. Um, and then there was another study which said, no, there's no difference. 
Um, and in the end, what if it's the reaction to being pregnant, the reaction to having a diastasis, the reaction of fear, or the reaction of screw it, I'm going to do whatever I want. What if they're the determining factors which may or may not make your diastasis worse? What if you're like, nah, I'm going to, I'm going to keep my flat tummy as much as possible. And so you just learn how to really grip and bear down and, um, you know, or, or, and, and I know that we're talking about during pregnancy or prevention or before getting pregnant, even, you know, oh, the stronger your abs are, the worse they're going to tear during pregnancy. Like, no, I, I don't think that's true. Um, and the evidence isn't there for it. I, I think I've seen some studies. I'd have to, I'd have to go look for it. Um, but yeah, it's it's not computing in my head. It's not computing in my head that it is unanimous. Um, they did look at activity. However, um, I don't think it's it's a major. It's I don't think it's a big thing at all. In fact, I'm pretty sure the consensus is that it's not. I'm trying to be as accurate as possible. My bias and my belief is, no, that's yeah. ridiculous. Don't worry about that. Yeah. Okay. When it comes to athletes, right, and you and you watch them train and things like that, at what point would, would you want to say, hang on, let's try and change your course strategy here because you may be going down that route of maybe getting a separation? Um. So first of all, it's very, very rare that it's going to happen in one shot, right? Like it's going to happen because you did one rep too many. Well, that was it. That was the moment I developed the diastasis, right? That's usually not the case. I'm not saying it can't happen. It's just usually not the way. So when I'm watching an athlete, am I coaching or am I being a physio? What is the goal of me watching them? Uh, if the goal is to, to ensure that they're doing things in a way that minimizes whatever risks that they're concerned of, then I think what I'm looking for is what is your chosen technique? What are you trying to do and how are you trying to do that? Because whether you're pregnant or not, whether you have a diastasis or not, if you depart from your chosen technique, then I think it's important to, to say, listen, you told me that you want to keep a hollow position during your push-ups. I noticed that you're unable to hold that like you could last week. You're fatiguing faster. You're unable to maintain the position. Like now you have a choice. Do you want to continue with that? Which I'm okay with. Or do you want to stop? and change and modify. Now that's in a pregnancy situation. Mm. In a postnatal situation, you have a diastasis, you're doing a hollow hold push up, and you're unable to maintain that position after two or three reps. Then I'm thinking, it's up to you. Do you want to continue this way? You're already doing good at doing it this way. What if you held and we said that you stopped and you had a five to 15 second break before you resumed your set of push-ups again so that you can maintain that hollow position because that is the thing that you want to do, right? So it's more about fatigue management, capacity training, getting to the edge of the, the technique that you want to do before you depart from the technique uh, parameters that you want to maintain, resting, recovering and doing it again so that you drive positive adaptation yeah awesome now let's talk about the mirroring bit of the diaphragm and the pelvic floor this is oh, yeah. <laughs> outside the DRA topic but this just because i see it so much anthony it's like your diaphragm. You can see the diaphragm and the pelvic floor working like that. That's yeah, amazing. I see that. X-ray vision. <laughs> I see that the messaging around this, how it's super important that your diaphragm and the pelvic floor, they have to mirror each other. And 
And if they don't, then you have this Im imbalance somewhere and this could happen and that could happen. Let's, let's talk about that. What are your thoughts about that? I think it's just one way. I think it is one way. And I think it's important to have that way available to you because I think all of the different ways that you could use your diaphragm, your respiratory diaphragm and your pelvic diaphragm, I think it's important that you have the ability to use the different coordination that you have available to you in many different ways. Um, so, you know, I, I think the negative effects of not being able to do that, that some people notice and see and report, I think that, that it's important to acknowledge that they've probably changed that person's breathing pattern and seen an improvement, but it could be because it's different as opposed to because they're breathing the right way. Um, and uh, the other thing is that maybe uh, doing it whichever one way and not any other ways means that when it comes to an unfamiliar way, your brain kind of just goes, oh, I don't know what to do with that. And your coordination is not as sharp. Yeah. You know, uh, a classic example um, is bending over the cot to pick up a baby. When you have to lean on that cot rail, it kind of changes how, where you can put your breath because you can't, you can't make your abdomen distend anymore, not easily. And so what do you do? Oh no, that pressure is going down to my pelvic floor. Or oh, that's not a problem because I've practiced in many different ways and my body just adjusts and it just spreads the pressure out in different ways and my diaphragm and my pelvic floor move differently. I think, I think that's important. Just because we picked out something that people often don't do doesn't mean that they were doing it wrong. It just it doesn't mean that this way that they weren't doing it is right. It just means that it's another way that you can look at to practice. And I do teach that. I think that it's important. If you're used to raising your pelvic floor at the same time as descending your diaphragm and that is the only strategy that you know how to use, well, then, yeah, I want to give you the descend the pelvic floor with the descend the diaphragm. I think that that's important because now you have two strategies to use, um, but not because you were doing it wrong before. In fact, you're doing it so well, you don't need to practice that anymore. Yeah, yeah it's just about doing things in different ways and building capacity and adaptability in different way, right? Like yeah. learning all the breathings, essentially. Yes. Yeah, that's why I don't discourage people who do upper chest breathing. You know, upper chest breathing when you're not when you're at rest and that is your default strategy. Well, that's kind of, uh, you know, that's not very efficient. There are, there are uh, more efficient ways of, of breathing. It's either that or it's like, why are you breathing that way? Because your body, you, hey, your body's like a teenage boy. It just wants to go towards laziness and do things as the easiest way possible. So, sorry, the path of, of least resistance. The path of least resistance, you know, entropy. <laughs> so, um, yeah, it, I, I think it, it makes me ask more questions as opposed to wanting to fix problems that I see. Yeah. Awesome. What what kind of messaging right now about uh, diastasis that you see a lot that just makes you want to go ah right? Which is the... try to avoid them. Huh? I try to avoid them. Yeah. Um, I try to avoid seeing those things. To be honest, uh, the reason why I try to avoid it is because I think that most people that are that are putting things out there are trying to help other people. I don't think everybody's trying to just sell their course or whatever, right? Like, I don't think this is money related. Yeah. Uh, I think it's convenient that when you create a problem and then you create a lot of fear around it and then you provide a solution that is very convenient, it's, it, it, there's, there may be a conscious or an unconscious bias about wanting to change from that because it can make people a lot of money. Yeah. Um, but at the heart of it, I think people just want other people to be educated and helped. So I start with that. I just assume positive intent. 
and they're trying to help. So that's why I try to avoid it as well, because then I might get mad about that. I might be like, Rah! Um, but you asked me, what are some of those things? I, I think anything that has big red crosses on it, I am just not a fan right off the bat. Um, I tell anybody who's doing marketing for me that if I see red crosses, I tend to give them red crosses. Like I'm not into that sort of thing. Um, I think that's important. I think having a right way and a wrong way, that's the red crosses thing and the green ticks. I think that that's important to avoid because there is no right or wrong way and it looks different for different people. Uh, I think making claims that are not supported by the research is annoying. Um, but if you say that it's not supported by the research, that's a lot more tolerable. I'm okay with that. Uh, I think equating your personal experience, which is the lowest form of evidence, with that of research evidence uh, that has been well done, I think that that's uh, unfair. Um, and I think, I think you can politely and respectfully put forward your experience without saying that research is wrong because in my experience, this is right like that does that doesn't wash for me scientifically i think if you said something along the lines of that's an interesting piece of research my experience is that this result happens i wonder what is missing in between yeah. i wonder if when i put my results under the microscope of research i wonder what would wash out then um i think that that's a very different tone to just disregarding information that you don't like Oh, so yeah, that's important. Yeah. What would your advice be for uh, health and fitness professionals who work with people who have DRA and as well as your advice to people out there who have DRA? What advice would you give them? Okay, to the providers, the coaches, the trainers, the, the therapists, the, the everybody who's trying to help people with diastasis mm. please stop scaring the shit out of people yeah. like can we not do that that would be just a nice start let's stop scaring people um i think that's important number two it's not about me and it's not about it's not about you as the trainer coach therapist whatever it's actually about them and what they want to do so let's always remember that. If somebody says that they want to, I don't know, free climb a building and that's their goal, like don't judge them for that. Hand them off to somebody that might understand what that's like if you don't feel comfortable with that. Or like just shelve your own beliefs because you're helping somebody achieve their goals, not trying to make it your own goal. Like it's not about you. Um, Remember that people are strong, capable, and strong, capable, adaptable, and resilient. I think we need to remember that because if we start off by thinking, oh my God, that's the worst I've ever seen, like they're going to pick that up consciously and unconsciously. Like people have amazing radars that I don't understand. Like stuff, fly, I'm like Drax, stuff goes over my head, but I'm, you know, nothing goes over my head because I'm so fast, I will catch it. Um, Lots of things get past me because I'm just not aware of that stuff. Um, but because I know that, <laughs> it also means that I need to have a genuine and authentic heart because what comes out of my mouth and the facial expressions, which I cannot hide, um, yeah, I know that I'm going, I might be speaking a different message to what I'm, to what, to how I look and how I say it. So I think that that's important as well. Um, you know, uh, and if you don't know what to do, reach out. Like, there's no shame in that. I don't know how to do lots of things. Believe me. Um, yeah. So, in this, in the spirit of cooperation, if you have trouble, jump on the Diastasis Project Facebook page and post it. You know, uh, message me if you feel embarrassed to do that. I'll post it anonymously for you. You know, so why don't we just work towards helping each other? There's so much work for everybody. 
that I don't know why we keep trying to hold on to our little kingdoms and fiefdoms and, you know, hey, this is mine. Um, and I'm guilty of that. I put my hand up. I'm guilty of it. It is natural to be protective of that sort of stuff. But in the end, if people can accept my flaws, um, then, you know, and my mistakes, then I think that that's very generous of them. And I think I have to be, I have to be generous to other people. That's why I assume positive intent. Somebody's got to be like outwardly saying, no, I'm just trying to rip people off. This is why I do what I do. Well, that's just rude. I don't want to be your friend. <laughs> but yeah, I haven't met people like that. <laughs> so. And to, to the people who have diastasis? Oh, the people who have diastasis. Yes, because you like to double barrel your questions yeah. and I tend to forget them. Um, to the people who have diastasis. Yeah, it's not the end of the world, despite how much it might feel for you that it is the end of the world. Um, thankfully, it is not a fatal condition. So that's, that's, in, that's in the favor of the diastasis, not to minimize what people are going through, but that's why physios and trainers are really good at this sort of stuff because you don't need an emergency surgery to save your life, usually from a diastasis. A hernia can be, of course, dangerous, but very, very rarely. Um, so I think remembering that there's lots of things that you can train for, there's, um, there's a lot of misinformation and older information out there that people like to repeat. Um, and you always have to ask yourself, what is the end goal of that person? And, and I think you should ask that of me too. What is your end goal, Anthony? And my end goal is to give you what, what you want and what you need to make an informed decision to help you achieve your goals. And I try to do that in as few sessions as possible, because that that's my morals bleeding in, right? That's my ethics. And now some people, they like to come a lot more regularly than I would feel comfortable recommending, but that's not my choice. That's their choice, right? That's their choice because they're the one paying for it, right? If somebody else is paying for it, like an insurance company, that doesn't become your choice or my choice. It becomes their choice and they have to approve it. Uh, so that's why I don't see people on insurance like that. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Look, there's lots of hope. You can do lots of things. Uh, Claire, Claire Mackay, Claire Black has, you know, she achieved her dead hang pull up. Um, six months postpartum. She couldn't do one before. Um, and that was before she got pregnant. She couldn't do one. So you can work towards these things. Oh, and her diastasis has gotten smaller during those six months from 11 centimeters. She's down even more narrow. She's going to be meeting with Gronya soon. So um, we're going to find out what the ultrasound measurement is. But yeah, she keeps improving. And she's, you know, 11 centimeter diastasis it started off at. And that was a measured one on ultrasound. So the, the message is really just get stronger, right? Get stronger and do the activity. <laughs> I, yes, I don't have a problem with get stronger as a message. Yeah. It's, it's get stronger than what you need to do the goal activity because yeah. of the anchoring effect, right? If you're stronger than you, are, than you need to be for the activity you want to do, then you're training you're, you're making training harder than the goal so that the goal becomes easier. Make your training harder than life so that life becomes easier. I love that. Yeah, yeah. amazing. Now, to finish off, I know you're doing amazing things with the um, DRA project, Anthony. Why don't you talk to us about that, why you started it and the whole idea behind it? Yeah, so... I was, not I was not able to avoid some of that diastasis information that you spoke about before. Um, and it was making me mad. And so I thought, you know what? We need to put information out there. And uh, I wanted it to be a consult-based um, thing to start with uh, because I, I think people needed to see from start to finish 
what a consult could look like in a way that was different to what they may be already getting. I'm not saying I made this method up or that I that I invented anything that I do, to be honest. Um, you know, I, I, I think that it's important, though, not to cherry pick the good parts of something. So I want people to be able to see that, whether I made mistakes or not, uh, and to have that available for people, and then to have the best quality information about diastasis so that people can, can go and get the information that they need and the resources and see the research and have a program that they can choose and make up as they go along, or that they can have one that has been templated for them. Like I want people to have basically the best of every course out there yeah. available for whatever donation you can make. And I think PayPal limited, I think $5 is about the minimum that PayPal has as a donation. So five, $5 is the minimum. Um, and so you can access a course worth thousands of dollars um, for as little as $5, if that's all you can afford. Um, I, you know, obviously, I'd love people to pay what they think it's worth and think about the course and the and the quality that you get from it, the amount of information and resources that you get from it and um, donate as you can. But I'll accept anything. It's I know I'm not doing it to make money. That's for sure. Yeah, you spent a lot of hours, uh, you know, working on it for free. I know that much. Um, and it's been going on for a while, hasn't it? No. Yeah, three, three and a bit years, nearly three and a half years, three, three and a quarter years. How do uh, people get access to it? Uh, it will be on Embodia app, but diastasis.info is the best place to go for now. Um, it has a, a webinar that explains what we're trying to do. Um, we are looking still for um, people willing to volunteer their case. We're looking for five plus centimeters of diastasis width um and that's at rest so generally speaking the width of your hand at rest um and if not on active contraction uh, like like that would definitely be cool um and uh anyone who is planning on getting an abdominoplasty and following your journey on post abdominoplasty. We've already got a, a, a couple through there that way. I, I would love to have more so that people can see different, different results from that. Um, yeah, that's, that's what we're looking for. You do have other courses on, on diastasis, don't you? Like, um, yeah. yeah, the diastasis. Look, if you want to help fund the the diastasis project, please consider taking diastasis reframed. It's a uh, it's a course that's been broken up into, you know, roughly 10, 15 minute segments so that you can go through the course that way. There are handouts, there are notes, there's frameworks, there's checklists, there's discussion there's lots of high quality physios on there and and health that professionals and fitness amazing. professionals and i was watching it my mind was going boo, 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 boo. i was like oh this is <laughs> it was amazing to just watch all of you chat and discuss and debate in in such a respectful way as well because at the end of the day that's what it's about right working together bringing your experience at the same time as having a look at research but when research is lacking then you kind of have your experience to go with right absolutely yeah. absolutely so um yeah on on that course there's some really really great educators in fact there's a lot of educators on that course um so that's really helpful to have their experience as a part of that and um, yeah, that's that. And then Lisa Ryan and I, we, um, she gave me permission to, to release her initial consult with me. Um, and we discuss two years later, what it was like, what she was thinking, how things have changed. And um, yeah, it was really fun. It was really fun to do that with her and um, yeah. That, that that was good too and that's a that's a 
relatively cheap course to access as well. Um, so, yeah, it's both of those would help fund the diastasis project. Yeah. Um, on on that diastasis project, there's like a ridiculous amount of consults uh, available for people. I think we've got 35 different people. It, we must be coming up to 60 consults soon. Yeah. So, uh, like consultation sessions and 35 or 40. So it's a lot of video preparation work, actually. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, we'll get there. Slowly, slowly. Shway, shway. Siga, siga. All right, ladies and gents, if you're, like I said, um, like Anthony said, if you're a health and fitness professional, get into the DIY project. There's so much knowledge on there, so much experience, so much to know. And just watching Anthony in action from experience, it's not something you really want to miss. <laughs> um, but yeah, and I think that's it from us today. Anthony, was there anything else you wanted to add? Uh, no, if people would love to go to diastasis.info and check that out, that would be fantastic. The Facebook group is the Diastasis Project. Yeah. Um, and you can also follow us on Instagram at the Diastasis Project. Um, any support, even just liking and subscribing to the YouTube channel um, and, uh, you know, anything that, that you can help in that way would be greatly appreciated and will help to further the spread of this knowledge. Um, and if you'd like to contribute your professional skills, we need people from video editing and captioning uh, through to people to write the content and provide uh, exercise demonstration videos. I'm looking at you, oh, yes, sir. Um, um, bring on. <laughs> um, so yeah, we, we need as many different variations and options as we can because we want people to see the the broad um the broad well the breadth of the the experience that's out there and the way that one person explains it might land differently to the way that somebody else does so you know we, it really is inclusive and please do not think that you you don't know enough your voice, your unique voice means that you present something a little bit differently to me, even if we read from the same script. So it's important to get your message out there because it comes from your voice and um, that's what we want to support. Absolutely. And another thing I also wanted to say, especially for my fellow health and, and, and fitness professionals is we need to stay curious right we need to keep asking questions there isn't a silly question just keep challenging beliefs in our biases and assumptions because a, a lot of the times we uh, uh, practice from that lens of our own biases and assumption and we can be missing big pieces pieces that would actually help the person in front of us so keep challenging our thoughts right and being okay with saying i don't know the answer but i can go and find out you know, or we can try this and that without making stories um, and uh, uh, acknowledging our biases at the same time, because it's okay to say, you know what, I'm going to try this, not because it's the best way, but it's my bias and it's how I know what to do, right? So at least the person in front of you is aware of what it is that you're trying to do, right? Exactly. Love it, Yusra. Thank you for that. All right. All right, everybody, thank you for joining us. If you have any questions for Anthony, he loves questions. I know this. So do reach out to him. I'm sure he'll be more than happy to answer them. Do get, let, let's work together to, to serve people better, right? Because like Anthony said, people are strong, capable, adaptable, and resilient. Um, and sometimes the messaging out there kind of makes them forget that about themselves. So let's remind them, right? That's it. And if you want to tag me on anything, I'm more than happy to, to answer any questions that you might have. So leave a comment below um, and be sure to, to like and subscribe to Yusra's social media. And, um, and yeah, I look forward to, to hearing from you. Tell us what you think. And hey, if you think that I'm wrong, I want to hear from you too. Uh, it doesn't have to be public and I'm not going to bite your head off. I, I just enjoy interaction 
um so yeah thank you absolutely all right thank you for having me on this as well thank, thank you Yusra. thank you Helps so much to spread the word thank you for being on anthony always a pleasure chatting to you all right thank I'm you sir